we're getting towards the end of our time. We know about model portfolio theory probably, the need to balance out different types of investment groups so that um, particularly in difficult times, risk is thereby reduced. But it does mean you have to know your client's holdings already. And a number of advisors who don't bother to get that quite right, and they miss unsuitable products already being held. When that happens, when you spot a really bad one that you didn't recommend, you then got this problem, it's really a cost-benefits analysis of what's the cost of switching against the uh, what is available. Um, please, gearing, don't do it. I, I mean, that's a terrible thing to say. It's much too extreme. But uh, you do find extraordinary numbers of cases where the borrowing to invest, it doesn't, there isn't too, risk doesn't add up, it multiplies. That's not a very mathematically scientific comment. But you take the risk of borrowing, you add it to the risk of the investment, you add it to the risk perhaps of pricing if it's a packaged investment and you end up with a completely different looking uh, type of risk profile to the underlying investment. Presenting advice, GP5, you've got to tell the customer what you recommended, what you know about the customer, which is the reason for your recommendation. You've got to disclose the risks and disadvantages. If you've got a with profits fund, there's a nasty thing called a market value reduction. It's not an an adjustment because it's never adjusted upwards. Um, do explain that. Cost of your investment. And we gave you the brochure is not the answer. We are going to have to develop a culture here, I think, of writing good suitability of reports or advice, letters, whatever you want to call them. It doesn't much matter. And we finally get to the end by reminding you what execution only transaction is, I want that, nothing else. But even then, it's got to be reasonable for the customer to really be saying, I just want that. And even then, as you know, those of you in the wholesale markets, if you mislead a customer, even in a wholesale transaction, you can get into regulatory trouble, Goldman Sachs, or you can get sued, lots of different firms over securitized mortgage debt and various other instruments. It is not execution only if the customer fails to answer the questions. And insistent customers, that's the customer that rejects your advice, just don't do it. Resist the temptation. You should not put bad business through your books. And anyway, you are required uh, to give disclosure. It's very difficult to give disclosure to somebody who doesn't want to follow your advice anyway. So just please don't do insistent customer business. It's really not a very good idea. And I think that brings to the end um, my presentation. Can I thank you all for paying such good attention and for laughing in the right moments, which <laughs> suggested um, that you are very much on the right path um, or, the right, or at the right place when it comes to understanding the nature of advice. And all I can say is uh, it's a lot of the things we're talking about here in the context of retail investments you could apply in a whole range of other fields with suitable adjustments. Wholesale markets, corporate finance. There are differences. I'm not saying they're the same, but many of the same features do apply in those areas. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Now, Adam will be here um, to answer any questions afterwards, but I'd like to open the floor to any questions. I'll start with the first one, <laughs> just when you thought you'd get off easy. Um, you talked a bit about risk and weighting and ar attitudes to risk. If you walk into a financial institution, and I won't pick on anyone, but um, if you walk into one now, you automatically get ranked with a 11524, and you're stuck with that ranking based on how you answer a question. And if you don't answer correctly, I couldn't even buy a run-of-the-mill vanilla fund because of the way that I answered. What advice would you give to financial institutions about these risk weightings? Because now they're so worried at what both the HKMA and SFC are doing. What would you give in terms of advice to them? I think, I think the biggest piece of advice, I think I'd better stand up because I can't see the back of the room otherwise. Um, which is, uh, the short answer is that this approach to risk weighting 
is an absolute recipe for disaster. We find this actually in a number of different forms. You get these psychometric risk profiles, which is possibly what you're talking about. And which, I don't want to lose money. Yeah, I don't that's want, right. Yeah, the, like these that. sort of personality tests. My experience of them in recent times, and I'm not going to, no great expert on them, is that a surprising number of people show up as more cautious than they should. Mm -hmm. And I don't quite know why. Um, I mean, I've found a futures and options trader showing up as having a very cautious risk profile. And they are just, they, they're going to become sticks to beat advisors up with. And that's why advisors have to use them with great care. I think the real answer to the question is, if you're really in the business of offering financial advice, and here, curiously, hedge funds might be more better at this than, than almost anyone because of the more personalized relationship with investors. Um, you've really got to get to know clients. There's just no substitution or substitute for the hard yards of knowing a client, even to know that all they really need is to stick the money in the local building society or bank account because at some stage in the future, they may need something more sophisticated. I think we have to get away from transaction selling, which is going to be a very long struggle in Hong Kong, I think, from what I can hear, because of your emphasis on commission. But if you want to end up with really a really strong financial advice sector, you're probably looking increasingly at a much more, I hate using the word holistic, because I'm not 100% sure I know what it means, um, but a more thorough relationship with clients who you may have known through generations, the best financial advisors, may be actually very transactional based, but know their clients intimately through many generations of family or different family members, and these, sort of, these are the relationships of which businesses are made in the long run. Not the, you're a five. I mean, at the risk of quoting uh, a fairly ancient American folk song, uh, people don't fit into little boxes because they're not made out of ticky-tacky. Um, and there's an old children's song but, which had a political meaning to it, which was the idea that we don't fit into boxes because we're not little rubber objects. We're human beings with feelings and wishes and desires and different needs at different times. And... I mean, in a case I dealt with recently, um, what, actually, what the advisor firm said in its defense was quite interesting. They said, we looked at our structured product, which was the one in being discussed, and we classified it as medium risk. <laughs> we looked at the client and we classified it or him, that's the one where I wasn't sure it was the company or the individual, so you can see the problem, um, as medium risk. So we recommended the structured product to the client when they said they had a million pounds to invest. Can you see the problem? The structured product has features which are very, very high risk. It was dependent on um, the worst bank performer in a group of five. You can work out what the risks are. But it also had quite high levels of capital protection because the worst performer had to fall by 65%, which is quite a lot. And it provided a nice regular income of 10%, so long as one of our beloved investment banks, not layman's, didn't fail. In fact, the investment bank didn't fail, and the income is being paid to this day. So you can see that you can't really, this product isn't medium risk, and this client, which I'm not even sure I can identify correctly, is also not really medium risk either. And in fact, on your basis, you could even get a worse mess, because the same client that week said, I'm buying individual bank shares which you probably regard as quite high risk in June 2008. Um, so in some ways, they were very high risk. And I don't know what their liquidity requirement was. And the structured product, though it provided quite a good income over quite a long period of time, um, was also um, tied up their money for six years. So, I don't, you know, so this sort of button-pressing approach to financial advice is really, really dangerous in the long run. And the honest answer is don't do it. Can we, uh, yes, this lady here. Anna. There's a microphone coming your way. Anna. Thanks, Adam, for the f uh, presentation. I think it's very good and very comprehensive. Um, the question I had is I think the whole model that you talk about fits very well in a s sophisticated financial planning market, Australia, UK, obviously, where uh, 
clients, investors always go to a financial planner, financial advisor, pay fee for it. Okay, I think that's the bulk of the model that more developed economies is doing. I think Hong Kong possibly the bulk of our economy is not at that level yet. I think the whole model works very well at that end of the spectrum. At this end, it's execution only, uh, information execution, selling, all the end to financial planning or financial advisor. If you look at most of our legal documentation, the customer advice, I mean, customer agreement that you mentioned, I think most, in most cases, you either see explicitly say we are not your financial advisor, or somehow implicitly say we are not your financial advisor. Okay, and um, I don't know where. I mean, of course, the FC give us all this is putting a very high standard at the far right side, whereas the industry actually is on the left or somewhere in between. I, I'm a broker, that's what I'm saying from a broker angle. And, and obviously, I like to hear your view, it's not, it's not yes and no. And, and also um, on the suitability, um, the, the, the move right now is changing the way that, yes, I mean, as a practitioner, we, are, we have our suitability obligations. But right now, suitability obligation is not a contractual obligation. Right now, the whole issue turns into a contractual obligation. When this dispute, obviously the client will say, I'm not suitable. Obviously, right? You, you, you handle so many complaints. Now the burden is solely on the company. You say, this is suitable. I guarantee you this is suitable. Go please, da 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 These are reasons. And the guarantee is suitable. And when complaints come, hey, you say it's suitable, now you have to pay in the back. So where do you find this balance of the big spectrum? And then everybody is putting the ruler at the far right hand side. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 you've described Excellent. probably the textbook regulatory <clears throat> question of our time. It's not just, by the way, in Hong Kong, we've got it in Britain, um, where we're still probably predominantly commission based, although there's a big move to try and change that. Um, I'm not totally convinced, actually, uh, that it's not possible, that it's impossible as a commission-based transactional advisor, and I have clients like that, to, pro to provide a quality advice process, even when tied to one provider. You know, when I first came into, became exposed to the financial services industry, which is probably 1991, the predominant role, way in which financial products were distributed in Britain was by appointed representatives of the big life insurance companies. Many of them, however, the good ones, the ones who are still out there, if you like, had very, very personal relationships with their clients and really did understand the sort of investments that they could get into were safe. They did understand their attitudes to risk. And what I agree with you entirely, what I was describing most clearly was the sort of more personal financial planning type approach. What I'm suggesting is that in order to survive under your code, and indeed your legal system, which says very much the same thing, you are going to have to modify your traditional approach and get to know your clients better if you want to reduce the risks of what you described at the end of your question, of the unsuitable recommendation coming up, often caused, in my experience, by the advisor not really knowing the client that well. Um, where the client is well known to the advisor, you can get surprisingly good results with quite modest levels of sophistication on the advisor's side. And the trouble is the code is just not letting you do as you said, put in the client agreement, we're not your advisor, and then go around re re making recommendations. It's just not allowed actually, um, and it probably never was. The problem is that you've got a culture shift that we're having in Britain, to cope with in Britain and elsewhere in the world away from a, a, a sales culture to an advice culture simply because in order to sell you have to give advice. That's the, the logical reason for it. Sorry Adam, I've got to cut you off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to thank you today. Let's give him a round of applause to Adam Samuel. Thank you all today for attending. Um, for those of you who require a CPT record and have already paid the requisite fee of $50, please collect your record at the reception. For those of you who have chosen not to, um, uh, you won't get any statements this time. For those of you who have questions for Mr. Samuel, please stay. 
Um, he's going to stick around. He's here as a resource for all of us. Uh, please do come up and ask questions. Thank you again. And on behalf of the Hong Kong Securities Institute, thank you very much. A small token of... Uh, yes, I was uh -huh. supposed to give this to you. Yes. So you have to stand up. I have to stand up. This is the ritual. Oh, yeah, so we have to stand here. And then we have to hand